Hello everyone and welcome to the Buck Stops here. I'm Catherine Murray. Well, we have certainly seen very volatile markets this week. All eyes are on what's happening this morning. I do pre-tape this is on a Friday morning. Uh, and the event uh, that everybody's watching is what happens in Jackson Hole. Fed Chair Jerome Powell will be making a speech. And the question really is, will he be hawkish or dovish? And that's what the markets have been moving on all week. Uh, to provide perspective on this and importantly where we go from here and, and really perhaps even you know, whether what Fed Chair Jerome Powell says or does not say or do, um, how does that really impact the broader economy in America, in Canada, around the world? Um, and what does that mean for you and your money and your outlook? Uh, to weigh in on this, we have Tim Gramatovich. He is the CIO of Gateway Credit Partners um, and a longtime friend, colleague, who I've been interviewing for many, many years. Uh, Tim, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate your time. Awesome. Always great to see you. Thank you. Um, Tim, I just I, I think it's really important for people to understand who, kind of who you are and your background. And, you know, uh, for, for those who don't know, Tim, Tim did start his career back at uh, uh, Drexel Burnham, which is a very famous fixed income house back in the 80s. So your whole uh, career really has been on the credit folks on the credit markets. Um, and, and in those days, Tim, it was used to be called junk bonds. Those those days, Catherine, right? That's that's uh -huh. that's what we're relegated to. The olden days when we had no electricity and no running water <clears throat> back in 1985. Um, exactly. Yeah, we were just having, you, know, you and I were just having a, a, a quick discussion about that, right? I mean, the, the idea is to say it, we we've you know we've changed some of the language now. Now we call it leverage finance, right? Which is you know really a kind of a euphemism for you know what we call non investment grade, which is um, you know, everything, you know, double B plus and, and below from a ratings category, uh, which, uh, you know, again, is, is, is actually an incredibly important market, uh, from the standpoint of, you know, providing real capital for uh, transactions, et cetera. So, yeah, no, I've kind of, you know, we've, we've seen it all right from 19, well, hardly all, but 1985 through to 2022 and, and there's been a, quite a few cycles in there with, uh, you know, uh, you know, from the 87 crash to, 97 and 98 with long-term credit, Russia, Brazil. We've seen the O2 TMT, you know, telecom media and technology meltdown. We saw the, the 08 financial crisis. We've seen uh, the pandemic. Uh, so yeah, we've been, been kind of, uh, you know, front and center for the whole package. Yeah, are, are we tired yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm tired because I'm The answer is no. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fascinating, I mean, you were just you know, mentioning with Powell, et cetera, right? I mean, it's fascinating, obviously, it's a fascinating world. And, you know, I, I, think, I think for investors, you know, I, I really spent some time over the last couple of years. I mean, I, I, I sort of, I, I looked at my market back in 2017 and 18, and, you know, I've, I've run lots of different structures from, you know, uh, the you know, private CLO, CDO business to, you know, the, the actively, first actively managed high yield bond ETF. And really 2017 to 2018, I became very disinterested in my own world, right? I was like, I think I'm going to take a pause because we, we saw some really, really silly things from the standpoint of very aggressive leverage, right? Really since 2009, Catherine, I mean, we really haven't had much of a cleansing, right? It's been a, a straight up market from the standpoint of leverage, um, really silly accounting metrics, you know, from the standpoint of we were joking last time you and I talked pro forma, further adjusted EBITDA, whatever that means, right? I mean, I call that EBE or earnings before expenses. Um, you know, it's just, it's just, silly right so so you ended up yeah really really getting to, to some, some goofy goofy things going on and then we had covid right and uh in, in 2020 i became very very interested in the market again uh, we had a you know a period especially in march of 20 where obviously had a, a complete meltdown in particular in in my world which is the the loan space we had a uh you know we we had a real entry point right it, uh, you know, the market just sort of vaporized that went from, you know, 95, 97 down to 75, 78. And of course, then, uh, you know, the, the Fed and various central banks and government agencies stepped in and vaporized that trade, right? Because it was like, okay, we're going to backstop everything and we're going to, you know, uh, you know, just, just come in with, with massive amounts of, of liquidity and capital, et cetera. So, you know, that trade went away real quick, right? I mean, it went, you know, it lasted two weeks. So since that time, I've been yeah. kind of biding my time looking at all the, the other stuff to say there will be an entry point, right? I mean, you can't, as many fingers in the dike as these guys are starting to stick in, you know, I mean, you saw yesterday, we were both looking at going student loans. Okay, we're forgiving student loans. We're going to come in, we're going to, you know, governments are going to then start paying people's electric bills, right? Because there was a big article the other day about how 20 million Americans are you know, behind on their electric bills. And I'm sure Canada is not much different. Um, and so, yeah, so I think I think we're setting ourselves up for uh, for an actual credit cycle, which could cr create, you know, tremendous opportunities. 
and should also create tremendous pain. So it's one of those things where you have to be very, very cognizant of what's going on. And, you know, defense is really going to be your offense on a, on a go forward basis. Okay, we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. So, Tim, you were just saying that you see a new credit cycle happening and that your best offense is defense. Um, I, I think we need to explain to viewers what, what it means with it, a new credit cycle coming on and, and what are the dynamics and situation that you're really talking about as to why that would even occur. And on that note, the, your most recent uh, research report that you wrote or, uh, you know, for your viewer, for your clients is called the outgoing tide. Um, which doesn't sound very good. So <laughs> put that all together for us if you can. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think the thing that, that, that all investors need to focus on is these big macro pictures, right? Because, you know, we, we've talked about this, you know, in the past to say that if you get some of these things wrong, you're shuffling deck chairs in the Titanic, right? Like, you know, you, you, you listen to, you know, and again, you know, the equity guy, you know, I'm, I'm a fixed income credit guy, but I mean, realistically, you look at the equity market, right? Because everything is sets off of that from a risk premium perspective as to, you know, what expected returns are out there. And, you know, I, I've looked, I mean, I, I mean, candidly, irrespective of, you know, everybody's opinion, so from 1980 to, you know, let, let's call it 2005, part of the, you know, sort of the, the financial crisis. I mean, those were probably the best 35 years um, in honestly, in the history of mankind, right? I mean, everything was moving in the right direction, right? You had, uh, you know, the leadership when you had, you think back Reagan, Thatcher, you had Mulroney up here. Uh, so, you know, everything was, you know, kind of free markets, let's break down barriers, literal and, and figurative barriers on the tariff side. Um, and so you had this global growth, you know, that, that exploded, right? Whether it was, you know, a, you know various Asian markets, China, um, you know, some of the European areas, et cetera, everything was going in the right direction. On top of that, you had labor, right, which was, you know, a, a huge cost in these things, you know, dramatically being outsourced and coming down from a cost perspective. These are huge issues, right? And these are structural issues, not cyclical issues. And I think this is where the confusion comes in for markets today is, you know, you, you and I are, are, are taping this and, you know, Powell is speaking, I think, as, as we speak. And you're, you're looking at going, okay, what is going to get fixed here, right? You know, from the perspective, you're going to raise rates. You know, they're going to go another 75 basis points in my take. Lovely, right? Bank Canada is, is, is going to do the same thing. But what gets fixed, right? Labor is, you know, going to you know, certainly will have some, it will have some impact because certain industries are going to get crushed, right? Real estate is going to get crushed. It, it's already crushed. It's just no bid, right? You haven't seen the, the the real decline in this because it's just gone no bid. That's U.S. and Canada, right? Residential real estate. Um, and so, so yeah, you will free up some labor, but the labor issue is, is far, far bigger than that, right? The, the labor issue really relates to demographics that in the last, you know, 30, 35, 40 years, the, you know, the developed world, and this includes China, has had on average one and a half kids, right? And you can't repopulate doing that. You have to have 2.1 kids is the is the actual number from demographers. And so, you know, you're, you're literally dying, right? And we know Japan's been dying for some period of time, Eurozone, same thing. And China certainly, right, with the one kid policy. And so, but you know, I think it was last that, year when I- me, Tim, let me just stop you there for one second, because what you're talking about, I, I hear and I see, and I, I, want, I there's a lot more to your thesis um, other than, you know, the demographics, of course, but, but I feel like everything is moving so glacially and that, you know, to, to have, um, you know, a new credit cycle or to have a deep recession or to have, you know, a large other event occur. I don't know. I don't know what the catalyst would be because everything's so slow that we can fix some of these things. Well, let's let's talk about the cap. Yeah, let's talk about the catalyst because it's consumer spending depression. You're not fixing energy prices with higher rates. You're not fixing food prices with higher rates, right? And you're not fixing the labor issues because of demography. And if you talk to companies and if you're involved in, in different you know areas and industries as I am, um, you know, getting getting people to work, particularly in the harder jobs, this where the skilled trades. Uh, even unskilled, you know, uh, labor, right? I mean, th this is a real structural issue. This isn't this isn't related to you know wage rates, right? So I, I think that you have a consumer spending depression that's arrived, right? Because again, whether you heat and cool your home or whether you eat, versus you know you know again going to Disneyland. I mean, this is all going to come to come home to roost, and you're going to start seeing this in the the numbers post summer, right? Um, so I think this is the trigger, and I think what you're going to have is yeah i mean these are slow developing things until they're not Catherine, you saw this in energy right i mean it's been slow developing until it isn't right and then sure. just one day it's punctuated equilibrium yeah. punctuated equilibrium and boom you know all of a sudden natural gas is 10 bucks 
Um, but the seeds of that have been sown for, you know, five, seven, 10 years. Right. And I think right. that that's what you're going to start seeing in the consumer spending numbers, um, you know, whether it's retail sales, et cetera, because everything at the end of the day, I mean, I, I keep hearing this, it's like 70% or 80% retail, everything at the end of the day is retail, right? You're selling a product to somebody. And, you know, so, so this is going to start getting reflected. I get the fact that we've got, you know, um, you know, mediocre data right now. Uh, everybody's locked in, you know, they, they, they want to travel, they want to do this and they're going to, they're going to borrow to do that, but there's going to be a reality check coming when you start to see these, you know, again, these prices, right? I think the electricity prices and, you know, these, 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 these data points about being behind on your power yeah. bill are just the beginning of the problem. All right, quick break. So Tim, you're saying that, um, People having difficulty paying their electricity bills. You're thinking that this is only the beginning and it is going to get worse. Um, I, I wonder to what degree, but also then, of course, what is the, what is the Fed going to do? Likely cut rates, in my opinion. I think your opinion as well. Um, and therefore, that would normally spur a rally in the equity markets. Yeah, I, I, and we both agree. I think that the, uh, you know, start with interest rates again, because I think that's such a, obviously such a massive, massive issue and a confusing issue too, right? I mean, you and I are both not believers in this, you know, this massive, you know, move higher. And I think investors can look at the, just, just look at the yield curve, right? I teach people all the time. Just look at, you know, again, whether it's the two, you know, two year versus the 10 year, uh, which has been inverted for some period of time, or just, you know, I mean, just, just use some common sense, right? Look at the 30 year bond. The thirty-year bond is three percent, right? If if this was if this was you know back to the seventies, as we said, we had this this inflation that's you know structural in, in the thing, it's going to keep going higher. Um, you know, that bond's eight percent, right? I mean, nine percent. It's not three. And I look at the world, and I, I still see. I looked at France and Germany this morning, and again, you're sub you know one and a half to two percent in the ten-year. So you know, the market agrees with you and I, right? I mean, the world just can't hire you know handle higher rates. So I'm with you on that. I'm not a big thing. Now, what we, you know, what we don't know is, you know, the timing, as I said, at the other side, because will they, you know, will they cringe and, and, and cover? Of course they will. I mean, that's a, that's a foregone conclusion. Well, let's talk about, I want to get, I want to get your point on the equity markets. Okay. And, and I think this is, this is the, 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 the big thing about the rally, et cetera. And I'm not dis disagreeing that, you know, there, there were trading opportunities and that stuff. I, I don't do that. I don't know how you do that, but I'm looking at these, these longer term trends that are in place. Right. And I want to go back to what I said before over those, those 20, excuse me, those 35 years. And what we've done is we've watched the PEs go from five to 40 from, 1980 to 2000 ish, uh, give or take. And they've been, you know, floating around in the, you know, sort of the low twenties ever since my question to you, because you know, again, you're, you know, you're, you're a thoughtful investor as well is if, if I'm right on the, the global picture, which is, uh, you know, again, sort of this, this, this massive change from very, very limited growth, right. Both on a demographic basis and just what you're seeing politically, right. As the, you know, whether it's insourcing, um, some, some level of deglobalization, right. Not full deep deglobalization, but you're looking at it going, okay, why would I pay 20, 22, 23, 24 times earnings for a, you know, a, a Procter and Gamble, uh, you know, a Colgate, whatever it is, when those, those, those growth games, those are over, right? Now I have these structural problems with energy and labor that are hitting my margins at a time when my revenues are falling. So it's a double whammy. And where I'm, so what I'm saying on the, uh, you know, on the, the credit cycle issue is, you know, the, the Fed is going to put as, and, and the central banks in general, right? Let's just not use the Fed because they're all in cahoots here. So they're going to put as many fingers in the dike as possible, right? They're going to, you know, nobody can get the sniffles. Good God, we got to get people. Wait, Tim, you're not supposed right? to be in cahoots with other central bankers, Tim. You're not supposed to be in cahoots <laughs> with other central I have to well, I mean, look, that. if you, if you ever want to read a fascinating book, I, I understand how Wait. Basel works, right? And it's like, they're, they're, listen, come on. It's like, um, it, it's, it's the old joke, right? It's like the U.S. gets the sniffles, Canada gets leukemia. So it's like, they're going to do, they're going to follow along just in behind the, the, the cycle. So they're all going to, they're operating on the same premise, right? They've been very coordinated since the financial crisis. There's no doubt about it. Now they're not, though. And that's another very interesting dynamic. Out yeah, that's fair. Uh, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. Um, and, and, and that's a, you know, that's a, that's a valid point. It still doesn't change my thesis though. My, my thesis is that, that, that you're going to get repricing of risk, right? And markets are going to get repriced and, you know, credit markets from a spread perspective, we're starting to blow out, um, you know, two, three months ago. And now they, you know, you, you know, you've seen a bit of this rally. They're starting to weaken again as we, we go into the, uh, uh, you know, into the fall. And what I'm saying is that no matter how many fingers you put in the dike, you can't create revenue, 
right? And so that's really what it comes down to. So if a company is selling you know, widgets, whatever it happens to be, that starts to slow down, right? And you're looking at it going, all right, at the end of the day, those are bad games from a restructuring perspective. You know, I was part of the first wave of the big restructurings in 1990 and you know, spent oh. lots of time in the bankruptcy courts understanding how this all works. So I'm just looking at this and saying, OK, these big macro pictures, these structural issues that investors are going to have to deal with over the next you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Right. Are they are they're in place. And to your point, when did the, when does that begin to get reflected? This is your argument saying, OK, it's glacial. And I'm saying it's glacial until it isn't, right? And I will tell you that the numbers that I see, you know, as a as a credit investor, are horrifying, right? I mean, the leverage are, that's in the system today. Give me an example. Um, you know, we, we, give me an example. Um, well, the le leverage loan market, which is my favorite market, it's the it's certainly the most uh, it's the largest most uh, you know uh, dysfunctional market. Uh, it's the as we said, it's the true high yield market now going forward, right? The smaller off the run credits. I mean, that market, I think uh, it was Grant's Interest Rate Observer did a little piece on this. I don't know. It was about a year ago, whatever. I mean, they're saying it's, you know, nine to ten times levered. I'm telling you wait, that it's probably wait, closer Tim, to six or seven times. Wait, we're going to hold you there. Wait, we're going to hold a quick break. So, Tim, I had to cut you off from a timing perspective, what the punchline is. What do you actually think the leverage, how much leverage is in the loan market these days? Yeah, I think that if you actually strip out these, you know, these these ad backs and, and you look you know, through to the numbers, I, I think that, you know, the, the so-called first lien market is probably north of seven times. And when I started, you know, back, I mean, we've been trading loans now for, I don't know, well over 20 years. Um, you know, first lien was levered at, you know, one to two times, right, a uh, uh, national rational EBITDA run rate. And so, you know, you look at this and, and, and I actually sat with Moody's and S&P probably, I think it was February of, of uh, 20. I was getting into this with them um, and we're talking about recovery rates, right? Because historically, you know, the, the loans, true first lien loans are, you know, you know, secured, senior. I mean, really, really, you know, again, good recoveries when they do default. When you look through to these leverage metrics, right, the, I think the recovery rates are dramatically off. You know, they're, they're not going to recover 70 cents, 75 cents if, if something slows down. Um, huh. They're going to recover 30 or 40 cents, right? Now, this is a trigger, Catherine, because the CLO market is a very, very big market. Uh, one I've operated in for a long period of time, too. And they're levered, right? I mean, these things are 10 times levered, 11 times levered. And when you have a structure that's 10 or 11 times levered with loan positions that are seven or eight times levered, let's see a show of hands to see how many people are going to think those deals are going to work, right? They're not. Okay. And so this is the, the, this is, this is the fingers yeah. in the dike thing. How do you prevent that? when the underlying is is a business, right? And it's like, you're going to just create revenue or you're just going to do debt forgiveness. I mean, you know, then, then you and I are you know, dinosaurs and I mean, we're all, we're all communists. I mean, I don't know where this ends. <laughs> Getting to be a dinosaur. I'll give you that. Me totally. personally, yep. <laughs> not too much, but anyway, um, but, but Tim, um, we only have a few minutes left, but you're basically saying, watch out. There's a lot of leverage in the system which people can't quite believe because we've already been through the financial crisis and we always thought there wouldn't be as much leverage, but I think it's happening in the equity markets and it has been for years as well. Um, but having said all of this, I'm, I'm curious, two, two questions. One, is there a certain industry or sector that you think has more leverage or is it kind of across the board? In other words, which one's going to fall first? And then where would you be investing? And you have been an energy investor for a long time. So I've only got about two minutes, but what can you tell us in, in that time? Sure. I, I, you, your point is a good one. I think I think the leverage that we're talking about in, in the credit markets is is pretty broad, you know, in that regard. But, you know, when you look at it, and you start to peel back. I think, you know, healthcare was you know massively over levered technology, um, a lot of these software, software, et cetera. So things with no hard assets at all, um, th those become vapor. Right. If you miss on those things and you have to restructure those things, what are you restructuring? Right. So I think those areas are a big concern that have to be kind of vetted. And they're also creating opportunities. Right. If you're actually going to get dig through and, and actually do deep dives in these companies. Um, let's switch gears real quick. And then we'll talk about the energy markets, too, because, you know, we've been that for a long period of time. Um, you know, stay, stay long production. Right. I mean, I, I look at this stuff and, and uh, you know, and I think, uh, you know, gas is now obviously front and center. Um, you know, you're, you're seeing this, this, this arbitrage issue. And it, really, this is a fascinating political issue, Catherine, because I mean, I look at it going when, when, because it's going to happen, right? When do we start to think about um, legislating non-exports, right? Where, you know, the U.S. now has $10 gas at the Henry Hub, 950, whatever it is today. Um, you know, and that may be going higher, right? I mean, Europe is 80, 
uh, I don't know how you run a, a, a world at eighty dollars gas, and you're Asia sixty five. So you know this this is a this is a, a kind of a natural global arbitrage that that market is is you know strong. There are some data points also in in the U S. that you know some of this production, particularly from the Marcellus, could be rolling over. Uh, at a, at a you know, mm-hmm. kind of a granular reservoir basis. So I, I think that this is coming next, right? And this is this is the challenge of, of the politics of the world is why would you be exporting this product? I think we're, you know, with Freeport back online, we're about 12 and a half BCF uh, a day, right? Why would you be doing that and punishing your own citizens with these massive, you know, costs, right? So I, I see this energy market as, as, as going nowhere but higher and it's going to be a structural problem. And in, in, in this is this is super important. In 2007, yeah. you know, when shale started kicking in mass, you know, on the oil side, right now, gas too, but um, you you really have had uh, up until really this year, you, you've had a really it's been a demand story, right? They, they, there's just been a thought process that you can just turn this stuff on and off um, at will. And for the first time in that period of time, we are now a demand, or excuse me, a supply story. And you're seeing it in the OPEC data. You're seeing it in all this stuff that yeah. isn't going to change. And this yeah. is a problem, right? So back to the issues, energy's high, staying high, and it's not going that structural. Raise rates all you want, right? In terms of this stuff, that's not gonna change the supply narrative. And labor is gonna remain a, a significant problem and a structural headwind for margins, right? So if you get the top line going down and your costs going up, this is recipe for massive you know, compression from a profits perspective. Yeah. Okay, Tim, we gotta leave it there. So much information and, and, and even so much so much more discussed. Thank you so much for being with us. Great to be with you guys. Look forward to the next chat. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.